Well, welcome uh, to a lecture by Eric Zulu, as is professor of history at the University of New England, um, and also a, a special graduate faculty at the University uh, of Guelph, Ontario, an adjunct graduate faculty at Union Institute and University. Uh, he's the author of Making Ireland Irish, Tourism and National Identity Since the Irish Civil War, which was published last year editor of Touring Beyond the Nation, a transnational approach to European tourism history. It is forthcoming. And co-editor of Nationalism in a Global Era, The Persistence of Nations, was published in 2007. As well as serves as reviews editor for the Journal of Tourism History and is the editor creator of the Nationalism Project, which, is, uh, which you can find online at nationalismproject.org. Please help me in welcoming uh, Eric. Thanks. So does this mic work? Can you hear me? All right, excellent. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Anwar, and thank you uh, for coming out. Also, thank you to those of you watching online. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Center for Global Humanities for inviting me to take part in this series. Uh, the Center for Global Humanities promises to do a really wonderful thing. Uh, a wonderful thing for the University of New England by helping to put our humanities programs on the map. Uh, a wonderful thing for the Portland area by providing a, a real vibrant intellectual life and a, and a series of uh, really top flight speakers over the course of the year. And boy, the, the schedule for next year looks fantastic. Um, and also, uh, it promises to do a pretty extraordinary thing for the humanities as well, which seem to be in a lot of ways under attack at the moment. I was disturbed looking at British newspapers uh, about two weeks ago to discover a, an across-the-board cut of uh, education funding in Britain, which is going to hit the humanities, of course, cutting back on course offerings, cutting back on research, and so on and so forth. And the Center for Global Humanities, by showcasing the relevance of what it is that humanists do for casting some light on vexing social challenges, and indeed, as I hope to do this evening, showing also when things work, because occasionally they do. And that's sort of an exciting thing. So it really is a, 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 a real thrill to, to be here and, and to be able to take part in the series. What I'd like to talk about this evening is tourism, which uh, for a very long time scholars considered to be sort of trivial. Why is it that something we do for fun, uh, for leisure, would be of any use in terms of scholarship? But the truth of the matter is, it is a very important topic, an exceedingly important topic, with extraordinary implications uh, for the world community. The size of the industry alone gives some indication of its importance as a topic of study. The most recent figures that we have are from 2008, now just before the global economic downturn. So the numbers that I'm going to quote are probably down a little bit. I know they're down in Ireland. We've got some new numbers in the last couple of weeks from Ireland. But in 2008, tourism globally was worth 1.1 trillion US dollars a year. Now to save you doing the math, that works out to $3 billion a day. Well, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking some real money. And I'd say that's pretty real money. Tourism accounts for 30% of the world's exports of commercial services, 6% of overall exports globally. It is responsible for 6, uh, 6 to 7% of jobs around the world. In the leading advanced industrialized nations, tourism is responsible uh, for between 2 and 10% of gross domestic product. And in some areas of the world that are less developed, it's worth far more. Now, these numbers alone are truly amazing, truly exciting. For myself, as a scholar of identity, what interests me is the fact that in 2008, again, the most recent numbers that we have from the World Tourism Organization, 
we find that there were 922 million tourist arrivals. 922 million guests coming into host communities, coming into communities, meeting with people, and spending money. 922 million. And in 2008, again, right before the economic downturn, tourism was growing at a rate of about 2% a year. And it had been doing that for roughly the last 20 or so years, which is a pretty striking thing. Now, again, it's this question of guests coming into host communities that interests me, and which has, in fact, interested quite a few scholars. What happens? when tourists go into local communities? What impact do tourists have on these places? Sometimes the impact is pretty grim. Scholars have done a lot of research on this and studying many of the places that they've looked at, they have found some really depressing results. For example, they've noted that authentic local culture in many, many places has been virtually destroyed by tourism and replaced by what amounts to a sort of disney image of that place, an image that's created by somebody not of that location for the consumption of others, creating what the critic Dean McCannell called little hyperreal celluloid animal deities, populating what were once vibrant local communities. Further study has shown that, in many cases, tourism has profoundly uh, altered the, uh, the, the local economy by driving up costs. It has brought extraordinary pollution. It has taken money out of local communities, which already weren't terribly well-to-do, and shipped it abroad. And it has otherwise undermined local ways of being. Now, I want to delve briefly into the secondary literature. This is not my own research, but it sets up a, a counterpoint to the case that I want to spend the most time on today, which of course is Ireland. So what I'd like to do is briefly talk about Cancun on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Tourism in the region started about 40 years ago under the leadership of the then dominant PRI political party, which had dominated since the late 1920s. The PRI decided that tourism development would be a cornerstone of Mexican economic development, and the Yucatan would be a center of that. And so they began a process of trying to increase tourism in the region. They did this by engaging in a process of quite literally selling out the Yucatan. They made deals, favors were given. They contacted a variety of developers outside of Mexico, particularly in the United States, but large multinational concerns as well. And on the surface, this was an extraordinarily successful thing. If you look at it from purely economic terms, certainly it brought in a fair amount of money for the upper tiers of Mexican society. Tourism in Cancun is booming. About 91% of the tourists there are Americans who come with little interest in what is truly authentic Mexican culture or Mayan culture and an interest in what they think is authentic Mexican culture. It follows that they're not particularly interested in the local tortilla. What they're interested in is authentic Mexican food in the sense that they encounter it at chain restaurants like Margaritas and On the Border, two chains we have here in Portland. And in order to provide them with that food, food is imported from outside, not grown in the local area. The agriculture has been permanently undermined there. Instead, it's shipped in at great expense, driving up costs and, of course, damaging the local culture. The Mayan community, for its part, has been left with low-paying jobs as maintenance workers and cleaners in the resorts. Now, I suppose there have been occasional success stories. From time to time, somebody is able to work extra hard work long hours, earn some extra money, and 
move into some sort of relative comfort. But the far more common story for the local Mayan community is that they have been moved to what amount to slum areas on the outside of the resorts in what many call Cancun Soweto, trying to live off a subsistence agriculture and the pittance they receive from their cleaning jobs. The local culture, for its part, has been buried. The introduction of expensive consumer goods, the destruction of the traditional diet, which has led to serious health problems among many of the local community, the destruction of the traditional uh, communal act of making tortilla largely undermined, traditional social activities replaced by television, and the once proud indigenous population reduced to being wage dependent, landless, and utterly powerless. The Irish case is profoundly different. The Irish story is truly one of triumph. It's the story of indigenous agency, effort, and ingenuity. It's a case in which men and women, drawn horizontally from across Irish society, really from all walks of life, were brought together in the business of developing a sense of Irishness that could be marketed and sold to tourists coming together and not only creating a successful tourist industry, but coming together and successfully creating, or perhaps recreating is a better way of saying it, an Irish identity for a new post-colonial reality. In 2008, in the Republic of Ireland, that's the 26 counties of Southern Ireland, tourism was worth 4.8 billion euro, 6.3% of the Irish population was employed directly in tourism. And when we talk about tourism, we talk about both direct and indirect employment. Direct employment is somebody driving the tour bus or, or working at a museum. Indirect employment is people working in restaurants that are frequented by tourists or people uh, growing crops that go to those restaurants to feed the tourists above and beyond what would have been necessary for the local population. In other words, economically in Ireland, tourism accomplished exactly what tourism backers in the 1920s suggested that it would. It became a cornerstone of the Irish economy. Now what I'd like to do is essentially to explain how tourism helped to shape identity in Ireland. I want to look at some, uh, well, I'm not going to get terribly specific, but I want to look at at least three different vectors along which tourism helps shape uh, Irish identity, how it, or again, reshape Irish identity. I want to start off by giving you a sort of quick overview of the history of Irish tourism, which sets up the necessary structures that will allow this uh, development of tourism to play the important social role that it played. And from then, I want to go into those examples of tourism helping to shape a post-colonial reality. Now, tourism in Ireland has a very long history. It goes back about as far as modern tourism goes. And when we look at the history of tourism, we see it really starting in the middle of the 18th century. So right around 1750, tourism in Ireland began to take off, and people were attracted primarily to scenery. They wanted to come to the west coast of Ireland, which was rugged and wild, and which uh, in the parlance of the day would have been described as sublime. So they wanted to come see this exciting sublime beauty. They were attracted by another thing as well. It was a sort of perverse attraction. They were attracted to extraordinary poverty. Middle class and upper class, particularly English tourists, had read in the newspapers about just how grim Ireland was just how bad the economic system was there, just how poor the peasants were, and so they wanted to come and see it for themselves. And so there's, there's this sort of dual interest. Come see the scenery and check out the poor Irish people while you're at it. There was enough of this tourist traffic but that, uh, so that by the second half of the 19th century, uh, by the second half of the 19th century, there were the beginnings of what would become a modern tourist industry, largely run, it should be said, by English entrepreneurs. So for example, there was a tourist development association run by an Englishman. The 
railway companies in Ireland were all English railway companies, and those companies devoted a huge effort to trying to uh, shape Irish tourism as, or Ireland as something that people would want to come see. It was only after Ireland attained what for our purposes we'll call independence in 1921 that the story was able to shift so that the Irish were the ones who were able to start shaping their own tourist product and indeed shape their own identity in a way that they couldn't do while a colony. There isn't anything terribly surprising about the fact that in 1923, after a brutal two-year civil war was fought, that a small group of people, which increasingly became a large group of people, believed that tourism was the savior of Ireland, believed that tourism could be a nationalist act, that by developing a tourist economy, they could fix everything that was wrong with Ireland. And let me tell you, folks, everything was wrong with Ireland. This was a country that had been fighting more or less consistently since 1916, certainly since 1919. The war for independence, which ended in 1921, quickly rolled over into a divisive civil war, which lasted until 1923. And in the process, the infrastructure of the country was virtually annihilated. Roadways were destroyed, bridges blown up, the economy, of course, suffered because there was no way to move goods or, or, service, uh, or people around. Uh, it, it was truly, truly grim. And yet, in the face of that, as I say, there was a group of people all across the island who believed that tourism was a panacea. Tourism would save everything. So as soon as the Civil War was over, groups started forming to promote tourism development. And in 1925, those groups coalesced into two, one of which we don't need to worry about very much because I'm going to leave Northern Ireland off the table today. That's the Ulster Tourist Development Association. And the other, it's essentially the same thing. It just transplanted into the six counties of Northern Ireland. And the other is the Irish Tourist Association. The Irish Tourist Association was a voluntary body. These were not, there were certainly hoteliers, there were certainly people who had an interest in tourism development, but by and large, these were people who simply believed that tourism was something that would improve their country. It was the best thing they had going for them. And so they got together and they formed what amounts to a social club, a social club that had a reconstructive objective, a social club that was going to create something great. The problem that the ITA faced in those earliest days was that despite the fact that there were many who believed in tourism, there were also many who were skeptical. The Irish government, for example, was exceedingly skeptical. They essentially paid lip service to tourism. They supported the ITA in words and refused to provide very much money. And you can't really blame them. Again, the infrastructure for the island was in shambles. Worse than that, when the Civil War ended, the Irish Republican Army did not unconditionally surrender. They dumped arms and proceeded to carry out periodic attacks and assassinations on government officials. This was not an ideal situation in which to begin building a tourist industry, but that's what they did. They worked tirelessly published a newsletter, they got in the newspapers, they lobbied officials, they traveled around the country going from place to place, I'll get back to that in a moment, making friends everywhere. So that by 1939, they had in fact convinced the government that tourism was a good idea. And the Irish government formed a statutory tourist body called the Irish Tourist Board. Problem was they formed the Irish Tourist Board about two days before Germany invaded Poland. And as soon as that happened, tourism was once again on the back burner. And for a variety of reasons, it would stay there until about 1955. But from 1955 on, extraordinary things happened. From 1955 on, the Ireland that we know was created. Within just a few years, signage was put up all over the island so that tourists would be able to find the places they wanted to see. 
tourist festivals were created, providing something that tourists could go and experience. Historic sites, which had been left to languish, were suddenly renovated and restored and marketed to visitors. And an increasingly sophisticated marketing campaign was put in place that actually uh, pre-imagines uh, much of what we would think of as pretty standard public relations procedure today. It was an impressive turn of events. And, but it, it draws me back to that hint that I dropped a minute ago about the ITA, making friends all over Ireland. See, this is key. The reason that I think all of the stuff that happened was possible was the nature of the ITA from the moment they were founded. They were based in Cork, but in order to raise money, because the Irish government refused to give them very much, they were forced to go around to all of the 26 counties, to the county boards, and to approach them to request operating money. Now, the implications of this are actually profound, because they went to these boards. They said, we want to develop tourism in your area. The, uh, the, the, the county board said, yeah, OK, so we'll give you some money. But we want you to do something for us. We want you to tell the government in Dublin X, Y, or Z. We need better roads. We need better infrastructure. Uh, in Dingle Town, which is now one of the centers of tourism, there was a fever hospital up on the hillside. And uh, the sewage from this hospital, the drainage from this hospital, would run down the middle of the street. And everybody up and down the streets was getting sick. So Dingle's like, well, clean up the, the, sewer, the, the hospital here. We need better sanitation. They also had a flooding issue. Fix this. The ITA proved remarkably adept at this, forming relationships all around Ireland. And here's why this matters. You see, it meant that the localities in Ireland were able to communicate their wants, desires, and ideas with Dublin. And the people in Dublin, the statutory tourist board, once it's formed, were able to send their ideas back to the localities. It created a dialogue about the nature of tourism development. Now, the Irish Tourist Association was uh, made redundant in 1964. But those relationships between core and periphery were not done away with. They were too valuable. So when the ITA went away, the Irish formed what were called RTOs, regional tourism organizations, which did the same thing. And although the precise makeup of this has changed a little bit over the years, the reality is there are still local tourism organizations communicating with Dublin and still people in Dublin communicating with the localities through tourism. This meant that when the government had initiatives, those initiatives went out to the localities. And because the government wasn't very creative, surprisingly, when the localities had ideas, which they had often, those could be brought back to the government and put in place as official state policy. This dialogue, then, this, these means of communications, systemic means of communications, made it possible to negotiate the nature of Irishness. And that's the next thing that I want to talk about. The thing about tourism when you're marketing a country as a tourist destination is that it's about selling distinctiveness. It's about selling something different. You don't go to China if you want to have lobster at a seaside lobster shack. You don't go to Boston if you want to experience the Champs-Élysées. You go to find whatever is unique about that area. And it means that if you want to attract tourists, you have to figure out what that is. Well, as it happens, figuring out what that is, figuring out what is uniquely Irish, is very much the question, who do we think we are? It's all about figuring out who do we think we are. And as I say, there's this infrastructure so that people right across the island can engage in this. And it turns out they got very, very interested in it. Now, I do want to stress one thing. When you go someplace, when you go to Maine, for example, have you noticed when you cross over the bridge and you come into Maine, all of a sudden it starts looking wooded? There's no big signs anymore. It, it looks like 
the pine tree state all of a sudden? Well, that's a conscious decision. And in fact, conscious decisions are made all the time. When you go to see authentic culture, you're seeing what somebody thinks you ought to see. In fact, the 19th century guidebook phrased it, this guidebook will show you what ought to be seen. Well, that's what we see. So what ought to be seen? Well, to go back to the Mayan community, of course, the Mayans had no opportunity to play a role in that negotiation. They had no opportunity to determine what ought to be seen, to, be, to determine what should be sold to visitors. So the Cancun tourist product has about uh, has, has less in common with the real Mexico than it does with the real Taco Bell. Well, the Irish case, again, is different. In Ireland, it wasn't up to a foreign multinational company to determine what Irishness was. It wasn't up to some foreign country to figure this out. It was up to the Irish people themselves, using that infrastructure that I talked about, using those vectors. Now, I don't mean to say, and I, I do want to make this clear, I'm not saying that outsiders played no role. That would simplify things down too much. In fact, outsiders played a lot of roles, but they weren't playing the role. In 1948, 49, 50, the Marshall Plan, the US government stepped into Ireland and said, get your tourism house in order. So there's an outside voice playing a role. The British, uh, the British uh, holidays and, and travel organization uh, often suggested things that the Irish might do for marketing, which they took under consideration. But by and large, we're talking about mostly Irish voices. And the Irish cared. I, I love this story. In 1949, an American magazine called Holiday published a massive Ireland issue. It was packed full of the most gorgeous photographs you can imagine. I mean, think about what you think of uh, when you think of Ireland, you know, thatched cottages and, and, and round towers and, and wolfhounds and, I mean, all this stuff. And these, these photos were gorgeous. The problem wasn't the way it looked. It was if you started reading the story. Because what they put in the story was rather less desirable. In fact, the article was a catalog of unpleasantness. Readers learned that Ireland contains slums like you have seen nowhere else in Europe with sickly looking children playing barefoot in the streets. Towns were depicted as devoid of industry. Churches were in ruins. Ireland's sometimes dreadful poverty was made front and center. The Catholic Church was vilified, standing over Irish society like something out of a Harry Potter movie, sucking all that was good out of the room. The article, or the author of the article wrote, infanticide in Ireland is appallingly common. Can you imagine this in a tourism magazine? Infanticism in Ireland or infanticide in Ireland is appallingly common, though almost from the moment a girl starts walking out with a boy, she is kept under observation by the police. If she leaves the neighborhood, she is shadowed. And if she has a baby in another area, the police return and spread the news throughout her town. Yet it never seems to have occurred to anybody that there is any other way of stopping the crime. Standing back as historians, we can say that a lot of this is actually true. There were horrendous slums, particularly in North Dublin, uh, slums in Cork City, absolutely true. Poverty was a huge problem. Housing was a huge problem. Uh, tuberculosis was a huge problem. Um, the, we, we know from recent uh, uh, realizations, recent information that's come out about the Magdalen laundries, of the way in which, the horrible way in which unwed mothers were treated. This stuff's all there. It's all true. But in a tourist magazine, presenting this to outsiders, the Irish, and I mean the Irish, were horrified. And across Irish society, people spoke out. As I was going through the archival documents on this, it felt to me like pretty much everybody was saying they were appalled. And not just that they were appalled. They demanded official government action. 
They demanded that the magazine retract its story as a pack of lies. They demanded protests. And again, I'm talking about everybody. The Catholic Church, as near as I can tell, commented on tourism about three times in the entire time from 1923 until 2007. This was one of them. The old IRA, the group that had fought in the War of Independence, they came out strongly against this. Irish American organizations came out strongly against this. The mayor of Philadelphia came out strongly against this. County councils across Ireland strongly against this. It was universal. This was not the Ireland that they wanted to show outsiders. It might be real, but it was not the Ireland they wanted to show to outsiders. The protest was so strong that two years later, Holiday Magazine published a new article on Ireland, an article that was sent to the Office of External Affairs in Dublin for vetting before it was published. The only objectionable thing that came in, out in that article was that Limerick City is not one of the nicest places on earth, but you know, it's not. So the Irish people, anxious to put the best face forward anxious to present the best possible Ireland. But what does that mean? What is the best possible Ireland? What is an Irish landscape? What is Irish culture? What is Irish history? Well, if you're going to present these things to somebody, you'd bloody well better figure that out. And so that was the next stage. That was the big question. I'll talk about one example of uh, culture, one example of history, and, and one example about landscape to give you uh, a sort of indication of how this worked. Ireland, for almost all of its history, has been a largely agricultural country. And in largely agricultural countries, one of the things, or, or agricultural areas, one of the big events on the social calendar is, of course, livestock fairs. It's a big deal. This is an opportunity for people who don't see each other but once or twice a year to come together, an opportunity to, to sell excess produce, an opportunity to sell livestock. This is a big deal. And because Ireland was largely agricultural, most of its festivals were livestock festivals. One of them in particular sort of tops the list. It's called Puck Fair. It's held every year in August in County Kerry. Well, Throughout its long history, which goes back to who knows when, Puck Fair had been the highlight of the West Kerry to, uh, season. People had come out. But by the 1950s, Puck Fair was inspiring an extraordinary amount of ambivalence. It was inspiring ambivalence because a growing number of people were concerned that maybe Puck Fair wasn't the best thing to present to visitors. Why? Well, for one thing, it was essentially a three-day drink fest. People stayed up basically 24 uh, hours a day drinking in the bars. I talked with a, a publican when I was in the town where this is held. Uh, he, he told me about how we take all the furniture out because we can pack more people in if they're all standing. And this is when I make most of my money for the year. So this is still very much the case. Uh, so there's that. Number two, uh, it's a livestock fair. I mean, livestock fairs don't smell very good. And you have a tendency to step in things. And is this what we want tourists to do? In addition to that, the other in Irish society are called travelers. They're kind of like gypsies. They're uh, an itinerant community. Well, they would come to these fairs, and they played a pretty prominent part in it. In fact, uh, contemporary observers going back into the 19th century said it wasn't a fair unless the travelers were there. Well, now, in the 1950s, the travelers were becoming that other. And suddenly, having them around wasn't such a good thing. And then finally, uh, it's three days of drinking, which is going to lead to fights, faction fighting, violence. So all in all, oh yeah, wait, there's one more thing. I can't forget this. Puck Fair, first day of the fair. They go up into the mountains outside of Killarney, and they catch a wild goat. 
They bring the wild goat down into the village. They put it on a platform. And a 13-year-old girl called the Green Queen crowns the goat king. Now think about that for a moment. A goat king, a 13-year-old girl queen. Do you get the faint sexual bestiality? Is that what you want to give to tourists? Is that what you want to present? Well, participants in the fair felt that Puck represented something uniquely Irish, whereas a growing chorus found it to be an example of Dionysian excess filled with drinking and fighting and thinly veiled sexuality what the American travel writer Muriel Ruckheiser wrote about in her book, which she called The Orgy. So, facing this challenge, the Irish now had to come up with an alternative. They needed new festivals that would be acceptable to tourists, that would put the best face forward, that would present Ireland in the way that people wanted to see it. And so that's just what they did. The invention of these new festivals took place under the auspices of an event called Untoastal, which ran between 1953 and 1958. Untoastal was organized from Dublin. Well, actually, I should back up further. It, the original idea was the, from the president of Pan American Airlines. So there's an outside voice. Uh, president of Pan American Airlines comes up with this idea. The Irish say, this is a great thing. We'll have a tourist festival, a month-long tourist festival with events all across Ireland. Fantastic. That's fabulous. Who's going to put on the festivals across Ireland? That's where the local communities come in. It's really up to all of the local communi communities of Ireland, all the people in those villages volunteering to be on toastal committees who decided what version of Irishness was going to be presented. And that's exactly what they did. They created all kinds of exciting events. There were beauty pageants, there were plays, there were music festivals, there were food festivals, there were theater festivals, there were sporting matches. This was really exciting. The Irish people got into this like you wouldn't believe. It was all over the newspapers, all over every media source available in Ireland. The only problem with Antosta was that no tourists showed up. So on Toastal only lasted until 1958. But the fairs and festivals created as a result of on Toastal persist, many of them to this day. So for example, we have the Wexford Opera Festival, the Cork Film Festival, the Rose of Tralee Beauty Pageant, and the Dublin Theater Festival, all of which are still important events on the calendar, and all of which are reasonably acceptable to a wide audience. The Irish people had come together and created a much more user-friendly version of Irish culture. They had made Ireland respectable. Now, it wasn't just about presenting a particular acceptable version of Irish culture. One also needed to present an acceptable version of Irish history. And the problem with Irish history is that it often seems to be a, a long story of struggle either with England or amongst the Irish people themselves, particularly over sectarian issues. Now, these aren't very marketable. First of all, the largest market for Irish tourism is actually the English. Now, do you really want to say, hey, come to Ireland. You've been killing us for 700 years. No, probably not. Do you really want to say, ah, oh, you Protestant bastard? No, you don't. You want to come up with some version of Irish history that is inclusive, that draws people together. That's what you really want. And so that is what official tourism marketing in Ireland was about and mostly is today. It was, Ireland was a land of saints and scholars. It was a tourist destination full of monasteries, full of prehistoric sites, which demonstrated Ireland's long and proud history, creating things like the Book of Kells, which I have to tell you is one of the most spectacular, illuminated medieval manuscripts you can ever see. 
the Irish were creating things like the Book of Kells at a time when most of Europe uh, just smelled bad. The government was very anxious to avoid controversy. And so nationalist history simply wasn't on the agenda. If it was going to be on the agenda, it would have to be put there by somebody other than the government, private interests, private clubs. Probably the best tourist site that anybody could think of is a nationalist tourist site, and indeed it is basically the only major to nationalist tourist site in Ireland today, is Kilmainham Jail. Kilmainham Jail is a significant site because from its opening in 1796 until it was closed in 1924, housed virtually everybody who's anybody in the story of Irish nationalism. There's a few people missing there. Theobald Wolftone comes to mind, but that's about it. Everybody else was housed there. So suddenly this place starts looking like it's associated with the greatest chapters in all of Irish history. Well, there was a small problem with Kilmainham Jail, and that is that in, uh, during the Civil War, Kilmainham Jail was used to house what were called irregular prisoners, basically those who opposed the Irish government. And in fact, the first shootings of, free state, of irregular prisoners car were carried out in the prison yard at Kilmainham. So the memory, even into the 1950s and 60s, that Kilmainham had for most people was Irishmen killing Irishmen. That wasn't something that was so marketable. But there were still those who believed in that long history and who wanted to restore Kilmainham Jail and make it the most important Irish nationalist tourist site in the country. It was a group called the Kilmainham Jail Restoration Society. They got together and were going to do this thing, restore this prison, which had fallen into rack and ruin, uh, through entirely voluntary effort. Great. And what about that whole Civil War legacy? They were very clever. Their very first meeting, I loved looking at these documents, I have to tell you. Their very first meeting, the very first order of business, was to unanimously pass a resolution that said history stopped in 1921. Civil War didn't happen. Didn't happen. And in fact, it was better than that. They decided that they would present Kilmainham Jail not as something that was divisive, but as something that was incredibly inclusive. Kilmainham Jail would represent all of Ireland. And it wasn't just that there would be these nationalist heroes there representing all of Ireland. No, the very act of restoring the jail itself became a nationalist act, became an example of Ireland coming together. So right from the start, right from the Kilmainham Jail Restoration Society's very first publication, they stressed the fact that if you looked at who was restoring the jail, it was a cross-section of Irish society. They even went so far as to say that retired, and this is just this genius, that retired English army officers we're helping restore the jail. I mean, can it get any more inclusive than that? The 700 years enemy is actually involved in restoring the jail. This is brilliant. And so in their newspaper, or, or rather, I'm sorry, uh, and so other newspapers, the major publications across Ireland picked up this narrative and started writing on it as well. Who said idealism is dead in Ireland, wrote one. Go to Kilmainham Jail any evening, even with snow on the ground, and you will find a living proof that the idealism of 40 years ago is still very much alive. The voluntary labor used to reconstruct the jail was integrated into the mythology of the prison. Those who were restoring it became nationalist heroes themselves. Although they'd never fired on an enemy, they had fired on the sense of hopelessness and malaise that resulted from economic turmoil in the 1950s. So we've talked about culture and we've talked about uh, landscape. Our, or we've talked about culture and talked about history. So the last thing we've got to talk about is landscape. And the thing about the Irish landscape is that it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. 
And a large part of the reason it's absolutely gorgeous is the legacy, uh, the long-term legacy of extraordinary policy, uh, uh, poverty and immigration. This was a place that in 1841 had a population of 8.5 million. Villages had to grow up hillsides in order to pack people in. And then, of course, the Great Famine came and changed everything. Between 1851 and 1921, 4.5 million Irish men and women emigrated overseas. And independence in 1921 didn't change it. The trend continued. During the 1950s, this statistic boggles my mind. During the 1950s, four of every five children born between 1931 and 1941 emigrated. Four out of five. This exodus transformed the landscape. The most visible thing that it did, aside from depopulating the island and leaving those wonderful vast open spaces that we all love, um, what it did was it left behind a lot of abandoned houses. And the thing is, if you turn off the fire in your house and it's a wet climate, and Lord knows Ireland's a wet climate, water starts seeping into the support structure of the building and within 10 or 15 years the whole thing starts to cave in. And so all of Ireland, whether you're talking rural districts or you're talking towns, was full of derelict sites. And the people in Ireland were so poor, they didn't have any money to paint their houses anyway. So uh, one fellow, Kevin O'Doherty, the late Kevin O'Doherty, who just passed away a couple of years ago, um, he was 95 when he passed away, uh, described for me what Ireland had looked like prior to what I'm about to talk about. And that was, he described it as, it had all the personality of wet cement. What a charming place. Now, tourists aren't going to want to see this. So there had been proposals to try to do something about Ireland, but nobody really had the political muscle. The ITA wanted to do something. They didn't have the political muscle, uh, but they, they, they certainly gave it lip service. So it was only in the 1950s, once the t battle to, to make tourism a national interest had been won, it was only in the 1950s that the, the, the force was there. And so in 1958, the Irish Tourist Board launched the Tidy Towns and Villages Competition. Now, the Tidy Towns and Villages Competition has got to go down as one of the most successful programs any government's ever put in place because it completely transformed this country. Absolutely transformed it. It was launched in 1958. In 1959, 82 towns entered. In 1960, 213 towns entered. By 1984, 804 towns had entered. Even by 1964, people, as they traveled around the country, started to remark on how profoundly transformed Irish towns were. They looked clean. They looked bright. They looked like the picture postcards that we all think of when you know, we get those little wish you were here cards. Now, Tidy Towns was a top-down program. It was the invention of one particular man, actually, uh, in the Irish Tourist Board. But tidy towns would have been nothing if there had not been interest in the towns of Ireland in taking part. If ordinary men, and especially women, had not taken it upon themselves to try to improve Ireland. And these, these committees, Occasionally, they were run by the town council. More often than not, they were run by the parish priest. And even more often than not that, they were run by local women. Tidy towns became an opportunity for Irish women, long left out of the, the narrative of Irish history, a, a, a fact which is being changed now, uh, but uh, for Irish women to demonstrate their organizational abilities on a public stage to show that they were more than just good housekeepers. They were stewards of Irish places and spaces with control over the aesthetic appeal of the country. The end result of Tidy Towns, as I say, was a complete transformation of Ireland. The unpleasant memory that was so much a part of the country that had been inscribed in the land was essentially erased. If you know what you're looking for now, I suppose you can find it. But you really have to know what you're looking for. 
in their place, Irish towns and farms and other spaces became symbols of a new version of a new Ireland. In places like Cancun, where development was carried out by external forces, and in fact the indigenous population was pushed out, there was no opportunity for a dialogue like that. There was no opportunity for that kind of initiative coming from across the society. Now, the last thing, and I just want to say this very briefly, the last thing about, uh, about tourism that's rather extraordinary is, as you probably are aware, in 1921, part of the Anglo-Irish Treaty that ended the long struggle with England uh, was the partition of Ireland into North and South. The problem that very quickly emerged was that the 26 counties in the South that would become the Republic of Ireland laid claim to the six counties of Northern Ireland. They believed that they were the rightful governors of those six counties. And this led to a long, protracted political struggle between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. In fact, the two countries became involved in what uh, one scholar has called a Cold War, when relations were, quote, cursory and truculent at best. The tension was great enough that at various points, the only engagement between Northern Ireland and the Republic was through backdoor channels, reporters carrying messages back and forth between government officials. It's kind of fun to find the papers now. Uh, in the archives appearing. Uh, there were secret meetings. There were clo behind closed door exchanges. I mean, very cloak and dagger stuff. While that was happening on the political stage, tourism developers, as it happens, were getting on with it. You see, here's the thing. And I discovered this just the other day in one of my classes when I, when I mentioned, so you know that there's two countries in Ireland, right? And everybody's like, really? Um, well, yeah, there are. But tourists, you see, don't know that. Tourists show up, they figure it's a geographic space. It's a pretty small island. How can there possibly be two countries there? And given that that's the reality, of course, tourists wanted to be able to travel easily. They wanted to be able to go back and forth, and they sure didn't want to be put in, have some sort of unpleasant political reality stuck in front of them. So tourism authorities had to engage with one another. And they engaged with one another one another in the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, 50s. The troubles start in the late 1960s. They're still engaging with one another into the 1970s when the first uh, peace agreements were attempted to end the troubles. They're still working together. The 1980s come along. The 1990s, the troubles come to an end. Tourism is at the top of the agenda. The first official meeting between the two premiers of Northern Ireland and uh, and the Republic of Ireland happened in 1964 in front of a Belfast fireplace. The top thing on the agenda, tourism development. In other words, not only did tourism help people negotiate the meanings of Irishness, it helped negotiate who was and wasn't included in political decisions, how Ireland would be presented on maps. Of course, the Republic of Ireland didn't want any border on the maps. The Northern Irish uh, tourist authorities wanted a big red line all over the map. They debated this endlessly. But tourism gave them that chance. And in fact, when the troubles finally, well, let's keep our fingers crossed here. When the troubles finally came to a close, a joint tourism board was at the top of the agenda, and it is now running Irish tourism, which is a pretty remarkable thing. So to conclude, the Irish case, although Irish tourism is not perfect by any means, it nevertheless provides us with a pretty extraordinary model of what can happen when locals are put in charge or find themselves in charge or take charge of tourism development and the creation of the product. It can, in fact, as it did in Ireland, at a time when the Irish had, for generations, defined themselves in opposition to England. The Gaelic language, because it's not English. The west coast of Ireland, because it doesn't look like the Salisbury Plain. That had been the, tr the story for years. 1921, what's the point of defining yourself against England if they're not your overlord anymore? Got to come up with something new. 
tourism was there to provide them that, to provide them one channel of dialogue about the nature of Irishness. In places like Cancun, that opportunity is not there. While I, as a historian, I'm reluctant to be prescriptive, I would have to say that the Irish model looks like a pretty good one. And it does seem to suggest that those who are responsible for developing tourism should look for ways to integrate the local community as much as possible into that development, because the results can be pretty extraordinary. Thank you. You mentioned at one point that four out of five of the children born within that certain period immigrated. Yeah. How much of the success of Irish tourism is based on the fact that their grandchildren came back to look at where their grandparents came from? Yeah. Uh, the, the rise of Irish genealogical societies and, and that sort of thing. Does that, how much of a role did that really play in the resurgence of tourism, say, in the, in the 60s and 70s? Yeah, you know, I had some really, all right, first of all, let me say that on Toastal, it was on Toastal, Ireland at home. And the idea was that those who had left Ireland were supposed to come back. That was the marketing. It didn't work. And in fact, and when I talked to people who had been involved in tourism development for years and years and years, they said, you know, we were always trying to bring Irish Americans in particular back. And we failed. In terms of the numbers, yeah, Irish Americans do go back. But it's not a statistically big enough figure uh, to justify all of the money that was thrown at it in terms of development. Um, one has to think that some of those people must have left for a reason and, and didn't want to come back. Uh, again, the, by far the largest percentage of people were English people. Now, how many of those were Irish who had immigrated to Britain? I'm not sure the figures don't say. Hi, Eric. Thanks for the talk. I have a question about the pub scene and, and wh where does that come into Irish identity? And because, I mean, when one goes to Ireland, I, I mean, I think of going to the pubs, drinking Guinness, and listening to, listening to you two. Um, is, is that something that's, that's being marketed as, you know, come to Ireland to see this? And uh, when did that occur? Ah. Uh. In terms of marketing pubs, the tourist board itself did not strive to do that. The group that did was Guinness. And Guinness has pumped a huge amount of money into, the, into marketing Guinness as a sort of exemplar of Irishness. Now, the, the grim reality is that the number one beer in Ireland is Budweiser. <laughs> but, and I, that is a grim reality, but, uh, but, but Guinness has, has really made an effort to, to, to put their product uh, front and center. And the, the, the thing that strikes me about it is the level of ambivalence that many Irish people have about that. Because if you think about it, do you want to, I mean, you're trying to put your best face forward. Do you want your national identity to be equated with an opaque beverage? And uh, I, when I toured uh, the Guinness Storehouse, which is the, according to the Guinness Storehouse, the number one tourist uh, uh, destination in Ireland. When I toured the Guinness Storehouse, which I had to do, God help me, about five times. Um, when, I, when I was touring this, I did it for the first time with an Irish friend. And her comment was, uh, oh my god, I, I, I don't see myself as a drink. Um, you can't blame them. I mean, there's, there's a lot of commentary. When the Guinness Storehouse came out, I mean, the Guinness Storehouse, if you haven't been, is kind of extraordinary. All right, You walk in, and there's this sort of pumped-in uh, industrial sound. Then you walk through uh, this gateway that has a, a, a big ring of television screens showing important Guinness advertisements, but more importantly, showing Irish cultural events like hurling matches and Gaelic football 
tying, again, the sort of, I mean, there's nothing more Irish than Gaelic uh, sport, of course. So tying the, the beverage right in with that identity. Then you walk around the corner, and I, I swear to God, there's a waterfall that pours down over display cases of hops and, and, and wheat and barley and you know, the various things that are included in Guinness. It, it's really quite striking. And then, after you walk through that, you start getting barraged with the story of Arthur Guinness is the story of Ireland. And that's, that's what they present to you. So I think there's, I mean, there's also the, the stereotype of Irish drinking, of course. And this isn't something I've, I've personally done research on. But I will say that it's a lot of mythology, actually. Most Irish people weren't wealthy enough to, to, to go to the pub and do a lot of drinking until very recently. Now there's certainly an alcohol problem uh, in Ireland. That's true in the British Isles generally. Um, but uh, yeah. But it's, it's fairly, fairly recent. Did that get everything that you did? OK. Uh, Eric, um, I went to Ireland first time in the mid-90s. And it was a cold night in Kinsale and rainy. And I got there with my two daughters. We go into a little restaurant. It was closing. There was only one gentleman sitting in the restaurant. And they were locking the door as we came. And they said, ah, and sure, you got to have some soup. We'll fix you a bowl. Come on in. So they made us a bowl of soup. We're talking. The gentleman sitting there said, this is, your, this is your first time in Ireland. Yes. What do you like about it? And we said, well, the tidy towns. It's just really cute. Mm. I was like, yeah, we have a contest for that. And we said, the brown bread is so good. He was like, yeah, we have a contest, the best brown bread in Ireland. <laughs> and it's Mrs. O'Grady in, in Westport that won the best brown bread in Ireland. And we said, you know, in the window boxes, we've never seen these flat. Ah. We have, a, we have a prize for that. So we, and, and then we said, and the bathrooms are so clean. And he said, I'm writing that down. We're going to have a contest for that. And we said, w who are you? He, he said, I'm Matt McNulty. I'm the head of board <laughs> field <Fairchild. laughs> the Irish tourist board. And he was taken. And so he, um, we went to Dublin. We visited him. He gave us books. But we said, the best part, really, are the people of Ireland. That's what is the best. And he said, I, we said, these little old men with dogs that are all walking along the road, and they wave to you. Everybody waves. And he said, they're brought up by their mother to know that you always wave because it could be your American cousin come home to visit. And that was part of, and I think, so I think there is that whole feeling of, you know, this diaspora of everybody leaving. And so I got out of that, the Irish character of competitiveness, they all like to have the, they like to win the prize, um, whether it's the cattle show or the, you know, whatever, the tidy town. And this whole feeling of um, being related to everyone out there in the larger world. It's a, it's a, there's a special part of that Irish welcome. And I just wonder if you, what drew you to this whole feeling of Irish tourism and if you would agree with that. Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll say that one of the things that every survey that was ever done until very recently, what is it as a tourist that you like in Ireland? The Irish people always top the list. And there was always uh, a, a narrative that the Irish, there, there were a whole assortment of stereotypes of Irishness under English rule. Um, one of them was the sort of jovial Irishman. When the Irish took control of their tourist industry, they took the stereotypes that suited them and they played those up. So Irish drunkenness, certainly they're not going to play up. Irish friendliness, that's going to be front and center on the agenda. I, I, I don't know. There's probably some truth to that story uh, about you know, waving to your cousin, come home. Uh, certainly, emigration was considered to be a, a national tragedy. And one of the, the, the at the forefront of of government uh, efforts and propaganda through long periods of time was we have to try to fix this problem. We have to fix immigration. We'll, we'll be able to do this. We'll be able to do that. And it'll, it'll stop. It, the, the, one of the arguments for independence was if we do this, it'll stop. Now, I, I've had a number of conversations with uh, people like Kevin O'Doherty who had 
started working for the Irish Tourist Board. He'd, he'd been the, uh, the secretary to Sean Lamass, who's one of the most significant Irish politicians of the 20th century. And then he'd gone from there to work for uh, Board Fulch Air and the Irish Tourist Board. And he continued to work there through the 1960s. Uh, so he was, he was really in tune with this. And I, and I asked him, do, do you think that the Irish are friendlier than anybody else? And he said, no. No. Um, what, he was. He was. What, what he said, and I, and I think that, and I've heard this from other people as well, and, and I, think it, I think there's a lot of truth to it. If you, if you travel in places that have been very poor, they're often the friendliest places you'll ever go to. Um, and I think that really what was going on in Ireland for a long period of time was that it was a very poor place. It was essentially a third world country uh, with, with certainly not tidy toilets. Um, in fact, a lot of the, 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 the story, a lot of the sort of cart satirical cartoons had American tourists showing up and where's, where's the bog, where's the, where's the toilet? And they throw the door open and there's a field. It's back there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think that that legacy of poverty plays a big role in Irish friendliness. Now, to, to finish off my answer, um, the, the competitions thing. The most recent, I'm not making this up, the most recent competition in Ireland to try to correct things that are perceived to be wrong or perceived to be a concern. Uh, well, the most recent survey of what brings people to Ireland, what do you think of Ireland, showed that for the first time ever, tourists no longer felt welcomed. So the Irish Tourist Board launched a competition for the best fulcha in Ireland, the best welcome in Ireland, trying to prevent what they called the frosty fulcha. Eric, um, I kept thinking as you talked about what happened to the goat and the 13-year-old girl. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, the marriage no, didn't last. Well, <laughs> Three days. <laughs> but isn't, uh, in your mind, is there any sort of problem with kind of reinventing yourself to be a marketable commodity? And what does that do in terms of integrity of culture and that sort of thing? Well, that's a great question. That's a, that's a fantastic question because, of course, I'm, I'm suggesting that because the Irish were responsible for developing their own culture that this is a good thing. I guess my answer is that culture is always changing and identity is always changing. National identity is not, I mean, every, if, you, if you read almost the entire literature on national identity, it will give you these definitions that make it a very fixed thing. It's that you have a language in common, you have a history in common, you have cultural traditions in common, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or it's an imagined community. But there's never an emphasis placed on the fact that it isn't an imagined community, it's a perpetually reimagined community that's always changing. And in fact, the thing about national identity or national culture is that it is always changing to meet new needs, which is why nations persist. There's been all this discussion about, well, the nation is going to disappear. Uh, and in fact, the great theorists of nationalism, people like Ernst Gellner, suggested that there would become, Eric Hobsbawm, suggested that there would become a point when the nation was no longer relevant. Well, if nations were fixed things, if the culture wasn't changing, that's probably true. And certainly true. But they're not. They're always changing, always evolving, meeting new needs. So I guess my, my response is simply that, well, what's happened here is that the Irish have negotiated perpetually. The, the precise language of the debate changes. The precise, precise dimensions of the debate changes with time. But it's been the Irish who've ultimately been running that show. And so yes, the culture's changed. Yes, it's been sanitized. Yes, young girls are no longer marrying goats. Well, actually, they still do. It's just that the tourist board doesn't say, ha, go to, go to Calorgan, go see this. Go see the wedding. Um, and I think that is fundamentally a much better thing than having somebody come in and say, you know, we're going to put a fake toucan here and we're going to have a sombrero on the wall over here and that's going to be your, your culture. Uh, what drove you personally to investigate the Emerald Isles personally? <sighs> well, um, I'm afraid that the, the story is, is not a, it's a pretty mundane. I, I was, 
I needed a dissertation topic. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it, it's actually more involved than that. I, I was, uh, it's more involved than that in, in that I was, uh, I was, I, I decided to become an academic when I was actually traveling in Britain. And I was sitting, talk about pubs, I was sitting in a little English pub called the Guy Fox Tavern in the shadow of York Minster. And I'm sitting there and this Scottish man, actually it was a couple comes in, and they sit down at the table next to me, and the man is very talkative. I had no idea what he was talking about. But he kept up a steady barrage of conversation for about 45 minutes, at which point I felt like I should probably say something. You know, it, it just at, After a while, even nodding your head and smiling seems rude, right? So, so I felt I should say something, and the only thing I knew about Scotland, aside from the wee kilty dolls and the, and, the, and the bagpipes, was that there was a Scottish National Party about which I knew nothing. So I said, how do you feel about the Scottish National Party? And the guy literally went ballistic. He spilled beer everywhere, I mean, and he started screaming about, well, I'm, I, I won't say it because it'll be on the internet for eternity, but he started screaming about FEBs. You can kind of, uh, English is the middle word. You can figure out what the F and the B are. Um, going on and on about this. And boy, I, I just wanted to understand what that was all about. That led me to spend a year living in Scotland, hanging out with nationalists, discovered that some of them were friends with people who were part of a terror organization. That was pretty exciting. That got me in further. Um, and then I end up in graduate school thinking, I'll write about Scotland. Uh, but my advisor was the foremost scholar of Irish history in the United States. And I thought to myself, you know, I know a lot about Scotland. Why don't I learn something about Ireland? And then I encountered a, a, a professor named Rudy Koshar who was doing some really cool stuff about tourism. And it dawned on me that tourism and national identity, which has been my real interest, were, in, were bonded at the hip. And that I could, in fact, by looking at tourism, maybe learn something about how Irish identity worked. And basically everything else kind of fell into place after I got into the archives and started looking at you know, boxes and boxes and boxes of dusty old notes and things. So it was, you know, it, it was kind of mundane, but somehow it seemed logical in the end. Yeah. Henrik, was there an age of national identity before the advent of modern tourism as we know it? Was, does, to, does national identity predate the 18th century? That's an open question. Um, I waver back and forth. I mean, th this is, of all the debates in nationalism studies, when is the nation is kind of the big one. And the problem with it is that in order to know if people believe themselves to be part of a nation, you have to ask them. And after you get out of the 19th century going backwards, literacy rates plummet. Um, I mean, basically, we get schools because we have industrialization. We've got to retrain people. So that's when you start getting people who are literate. You start going backwards, literacy rates drop off, and suddenly we are no longer able to ask people, what is your sense of identity? So we'll never really know. For my part, I think that national identity is this dialogue about being part of a nation. There's an assumption that underlies dialogue. I mean, if you're going to have a discussion about what it means to be Irish, you have to, uh, at, at, at the very base level, everybody, they can all totally disagree with one another. But at the base level, they have to agree that they're Irish. What that means thereafter, hey, that varies a lot. So there's that base level of agreement and once you've got that, people start debating. And I mean, boy, look at American politics right now. You know, it seems really divisive and, and divided. And, and I, I get these phone calls from, from Slate Magazine and CNN asking me, is the country going to break apart? And my response is no. This is sort of unpleasant, what's going on in the moment in the news, but it's actually kind of healthy <laughs> in a sick and twisted sort of way, because we're all discussing Americanness. So when is the nation? Well, it's when people start discussing the nature of that in some sort of broad configuration. And my thought on that is I think that it's really a 19th century thing. 
but I have to confess that that's defined by when does the source material show up. And that shows up with literacy. So thank you for this inviting me. Thanks a lot. Thank you.